So let me begin with thanks uh, to Madame Le Consul for those generous introductory uh, remarks, uh, to the Museum of Jewish Heritage for hosting this event uh, and for asking me to participate. I'm honored. Uh, I was called upon to do some scene setting, uh, and that's already begun. Uh, Evelyn Summer and the council have done a very fine job of stealing some of my thunder. Um, but I will make three kinds of remarks uh, to set up uh, the presentations that are going to follow uh, and just after I'm done. Some are the first order of a fairly general long-term nature. Uh, since 1870, uh, France was governed by a republic, uh, the third of its kind in the nation's uh, history. It was a regime born and consolidated in the 1870s, and the circumstances of its birth are relevant to the analyses and narratives you're going to hear later. First of all, it was a democratic regime uh, with civil liberties respected and universal manhood suffrage. Not just that, it was a regime of religious tolerance. Uh, it was welcoming to religious minorities, uh, to Protestants, uh, and to Jews. France is a Catholic majority country and has been uh, for a good long while uh, and remains so. But the Third Republic was welcoming. And one more feature of the Republic I want to uh, insist on, and that is its commitment to secularism, or what the French call laïcité. It ran nowhere deeper than in the nation's primary school system, which was created in the 1880s by the uh, Third Republic. So, I'll find somewhere to sit. Yeah. Right. I will go on. Uh, a system of universal, mandatory, free, secular primary education for every boy and girl in France was created uh, in the, 18, uh, in the 18, 1880s. And the laws that uh, created this system were associated with a prime minister named Jules Ferry. There will be no exam at the far end of this. Um, <coughs> But a feature of the school, school system was its commitment to secularism. Uh, the teachers were licensed teachers. They were not priests uh, and nuns. And religious courses were not given on school premises. And what I would also add uh, is that this system was created and conceived and implemented uh, in large part by religious minorities <coughs> themselves, by Jews and Protestants, by Protestants, uh, above all, a subject that Patry uh, Cabanel knows very, very well. It was one of the pillars of the Republic, uh, this primary school system. Uh, and the school teacher, whether me, male or female, was an iconic figure. So uh, in 1940, the Republic uh, was swept away to give, uh, uh, to give open the path to an authoritarian and collaborationist regime, uh, Vichy. Uh, but is it possible to wipe away 70 years of primary school education of the kind that I've just described for you, uh, which did so much to shape French civil society. First part of my introduction. Uh, the second has to do with the place of Jews in France uh, at this time. And the picture is a complicated one. And I'm talking about prior to Vichy uh, and not after 1940. It's been said, and rightly so, uh, that Jews uh, under the Third Republic uh, occupied uh, an exceptional place. Uh, in public life. And I was just thumbing through the program, and there is a, uh, an exhibit uh, at the Neue Galerie on the Ecole de Paris, uh, on Heim Soutine and uh, Modigliani and the like, uh, who painted in Paris in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, I could enumerate many, many more uh, such instances. I just mentioned one name uh, in passing in this in connection, and, and it's that of Leon Blum, uh, a name some of you may know, who became Prime Minister of France in 1936. And there were two firsts. On recommence. OK. He was the first socialist prime minister of France, uh, and also the first Jewish prime minister of France. This in the mid-1930s. Uh, it's something to be uh, taken note of, but particularly uh, at the particular moment that we're living through, uh, living through now. He took office at the head of a majority, a popular front majority, uh, which was supported by socialists, centrist republicans, and communists as well. So 
So yes, Jews played a prominent part uh, in public life uh, in the Third Republic. A second point of significance, and this is important for uh, what will follow, France lost 1.3 million men in World War I, uh, a massive, a massive bloodletting. Many countries, uh, the United States included, uh, closed their doors in the 1920s to immigration. Uh, but France did not. Uh, it was a welcoming country, plus ou moins. Uh, and people came uh, of all nationalities, Jews among them, uh, fleeing persecution uh, in, central, uh, in Central Europe, uh, but also attracted uh, by liberty, equality, and fraternity, and by the charms of French, uh, of French civilization, creating uh, an unusually large and mixed and very Jewish community in France, uh, with old line Jewish families, uh, Sephardi in Bordeaux, North African Jews, Ashkenazi Jews in uh, Alsace, uh, and a large uh, mixed community in Paris itself. But they were joined by immigrants uh, who came uh, in the tens of thousands, many of them uh, Yiddish speaking. Uh, so this is the positive side of the story. The negative one is uh, one I suspect you know already, that France has a long history of anti-Semitism, and I need mention uh, in this connection only uh, the Dreyfus Affair, uh, and in fact uh, uh, the Museum of Art and History of Judaism in Paris was mentioned, and if you visit it, uh, as you were urged to do, in the courtyard is a statue of Dreyfus, uh, which the uh, Never mind, that's another story. Somebody else didn't want that statue, and so it came to the Jewish Museum. This anti-Semitism is fed from many sources, uh, from Catholic sources, uh, people who regard Jews as deicides, from ultra-patriots who see Jews as rootless cosmopolitans, apatrides, uh, as the French say, globalists, as might be said uh, in today's world, from xenophobes who are ever more numerous uh, in the economically strapped 1930s, uh, who thought of Jews as uh, job stealers or unassimilable, un unassimilable, and also from anti-communists who saw in the likes of Leon Blum uh, the stalking horse for Bolshevism. So it's a mixed picture uh, with a long-established Jewish community at home and welcoming uh, to newcomers, uh, but also with a long tradition of anti-Semitism that grows stronger in the 1930s, even before Vichy appears on the scene. Now to uh, the war itself, and this will be the last set of remarks I make before turning the floor over to our first speaker, Jacques Soumelin. France went to war uh, in 1939. Uh, the Germans invaded uh, in May of 1940, and they notched up uh, a series of victories in rapid-fire fashion, uh, such that by June, France was suing for an armistice, which was in fact signed that month. It was an onerous agreement. Uh, could go on at some length about it, uh, but I will say just this in the current uh, in the current setting. France remained a sovereign, and I would put that in quotation marks: uh, a sovereign, uh, a sovereign state uh, with a govern government uh, headquartered in the spa town of Vichy which was led by a great hero, a national hero, uh, the victor of Verdun, uh, Maréchal Philippe Pétain. The national territory, according to the armistice, was divided into a number of zones, five in all, and Jacques de Milan will explain that to you uh, in, more, uh, in more detail. I'll insist on just two zones in particular, uh, a northern zone, uh, which was occupied uh, by the German army uh, with its headquarters uh, in Paris, uh, and an unoccupied southern zone, we're in 1940 uh, at this stage, uh, which was based in Vichy, France. In principle, Vichy was sovereign over both zones, uh, but it was constrained, and particularly in the north, uh, by the occupying power, by the Germans, uh, who had designs of their own on French property, uh, French wealth, French manpower, and ultimately uh, designs lethal in nature uh, on, France's, uh, on France's Jews. I'll say just a few words about Vichy because I know other speakers <coughs> will be saying uh, more. Uh, France's circumstance was very unusual. Uh, this was not Poland uh, in, uh, in, many, uh, in many ways. Poland, as you know, uh, was uh, invaded by the Nazis, part of it annexed by the right, uh, but most of it uh, governed by a general gouvernement uh, under the direction uh, of a Nazi ideologue Hans Frank. 
Uh, there was no intermediary regime uh, between the Nazi, uh, Nazi government and administration uh, and the people of Poland, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish. In France, there is something in between uh, the occupier and the people of France, uh, and that is the Vichy government. Uh, and in a word, Vichy wanted to be everything that the Third Republic was not. If the Third Republic was a democratic regime, Vichy would be a regime of authority. Uh, if the Third Republic was a regime of tolerance, Vichy would embrace the Catholic Church. Uh, and if the Third Republic was welcoming uh, to its Jewish population, Vichy would pass anti-Semitic leg legislation. Jews were never ghettoized in France, but they were driven out of public life, out of public spaces, out of jobs, and they were stigmatized. So, that's 1940, uh, and the question uh, that is posed by this panel is what will be the fate of these people? A rich mix uh, of immigrants and native-born, uh, what will be their fate uh, under Vichy and under the German occupation? Under Vichy, Vichy, which is an authoritarian regime that rallies to itself anti-Semites of all kinds, a regime, moreover, that's under pressure from a Nazi occupier animated by lethal intentions but also a regime that rules over a nation with powerful and deep-rooted currents of Republican conviction running through it. What will happen to the Jews in these circumstances? Uh, that's the question uh, that will be addressed by the speakers who will follow me. So let me turn to my next uh, role, which is to introduce the first speaker, uh, and he is Jacques Sumelin. Uh, a wonderful man, trained as a psychologist and political scientist, as well as an historian, uh, a man with a variety of interests who teaches at Sciences Po uh, in Paris, uh, and has authored uh, uh, more than a half dozen books now. I'll cite you a few titles. Uh, they'll give you a clue uh, as to what his interests are. The Resistance, the Holocaust, and Genocide are his interests, but here are the titles. Sans armes face à Hitler, la résistance civile en Europe nazie, without arms, Confronting Hitler, Civil Resistance in Europe. Another book, uh, Civil Resistance and Totalitarianism. A third book, Persecution and Mutual Aid in Occupied France, How 75% of French Jews Escaped Death. Uh, and there is, there is a, I think in the very titles, an indication of what interests him, unarmed, civil resistance, mutual aid, all the nonviolent ways, that is, which citizens use to fight back against authoritarian, racist, and genocidal regimes. He is also a specialist uh, in the Holocaust, and, uh, and he's published uh, two books that have been translated into, uh, into English, so I will cite the titles for you. Pover uh, Purify and Destroy the Political uh, Uses of Massacre and Genocide, which came out uh, about 15 years ago, but just last year, uh, a new book appeared, and that's what he'll be uh, drawing on for his presentation uh, today, uh, The Survival of the Jews uh, in France, 1940 uh, to 1944. So let me uh, turn the uh, podium over uh, to Jacques Semelin, uh, and I will um, join you again later. Many thanks, Philip, for this uh, nice presentation. Many thanks for your invitation. I'm particularly glad uh, and honored uh, to be here in this uh, Jewish Heritage Museum. I am an Holocaust scholar and other genocide, as Philip mentioned. But I'm also interested by the other side. I mean, um, potential victim struggling to survive. And that's why I decided to study the French case since 75% of Jews survive in France and I think it's unknown or almost unknown. But among them, almost 90% of the French Jews survived the Holocaust and 60% of foreign Jews. Obviously, these foreign Jews which were much more targeted. Had the war had stayed longer, 
uh, no doubt that these figures would have been worse. However, how can we understand this high rate of survival of Jews in France um, when uh, you know, the Nazi occupied entirely the country by November 1942? And having in mind as well that in the Netherlands, 75% of Jews were exterminated. This is the opposite of France. And 45% of Belgium. That's why I have spent several years of research on this case. I did so not because I am French, but because as scholar, Holocaust scholar, I wanted to understand this intriguing phenomenon. So, I did a work. First, I tried to collect <coughs> quantitative and qualitative data. data. <coughs> It is estimated that approximately 200,000 Jews are still in France in 1944. Uh, could be more, but I prefer to take this low figure. So how can you explain that? Is it thanks to the righteous among the nations? There are approximately 4,000 in France. They, they did a, a admirable job. Um, but you cannot explain the survival of 200,000 people, even if uh, these righteous were extraordinary in their rescue. <clears throat> Is this because the uh, action of the Jewish and Christian organization to save Jews? They also did a wonderful job uh, in difficult situations, especially when they want to get, uh, you know, foreign Jews war who were intended uh, in camps in the south of France. But you can estimate that between 6,000 and 10,000 Jews were saved by this organization. Not enough to explain 200,000. So the most obvious answer, and it's a bit my main <coughs> research hypothesis, is that the Jews, individuals or families, try to manage more or less on their own to survive in our country. So I ask me very concrete question. If they lost their job, what do they do to survive? Uh, do they move around or do they stay at home? Or oh, very little, you know, they move very little. Um, what uh, are the difference between, uh, you know, French Jews and uh, uh, French Jews in that regard, how did they be behave? Uh, do they try to, did they try to put their uh, children uh, away, to send away in order to protect them, and so on and so forth? And above all, how did they manage to escape arrestation? So I tried to collect a lot of different stories, you know, uh, many stories, different stories. Uh, to understand what happened for them. Sometimes it was the worst, sometimes it was more or less the best, the survive. And I use my former, uh, you know, I was in a former life, I was a psychologist and I reincarnated in uh, historian. But I'm feeling better. But I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's very good to have this two training to try to understand, you know, this complex phenomenon. So in this book, you find quite well-known names, you know, like uh, you know Saul Friedlander, Stanley Hoffman, uh, Leon Polyakov in France, but, and other who are not known at all. These stories are very, very different, of course. But you can find some recurrences, recurrences between them. So very quickly, too quickly, I'm going to present to my mind four major contributions of this work. The first one is this work, this book, present for the first time uh, a geograph geographic and demographic dispersal of the Jews in France. Well, this is obvious when you, 
uh, when you are studying this, they mainly <coughs> go to the south and the center of France. And it was easier for them to scatter because, uh, you know, uh, France is larger than uh, the Netherlands or Belgian <coughs> territories. But you have to take in account both uh, spontaneous migration and forced migration. For example, just after the declaration of war, September 1st, 1939, do you know that 640,000 people were forced to leave the eastern part of France going to a uh, region like Limousin or Perigord? Within three days, a, a city like Strasbourg was literally emptied from the whole population. Of course, among them, there are Jews. And came these terrible days of May, June, 1940, uh, where uh, the French army lost the war against the German. This is certainly uh, our most tragic event in the 20th century, since France definitively lost at that time its rank of first world power. And the consequence of this, listen, seven to eight million of people running to the south. Of course, there are some Jews in there. If you, have, you want to have an idea of what happened, just read this book by Irene Nimerovsky, Sweet Française, which is uh, an extraordinary description of this period. The consequences of this are uh, first the signature of armistice with the German and the formation of the Vichy government. And then it has terrible consequences for the structure of the French territory. Do we really, we can speak about French, it's called so-called French territory, as Philippe mentioned. Instead of, it is known, it is usually think, thought, you know, you don't have only two zones, but you have five different zones. The North Pascale, the North, uh, the two departments are now under uh, uh, the authority of the Wehrmacht in Brussels, bye bye France. The eastern part of the country, Alsace Moselle and other territories, are now integrated to the Third Reich. It's called Forbidden, Forbidden Zone, and it's run by a Golander. Bye bye, France. The most important, the largest, the richest is what we call Occupied Zone, okay? run by the German army in Paris. And you have the Fourth Zone, which is uh, you know, uh, under the authority of the French government established in Vichy. And you see in, in this Oh, I did not see it. This is this one? Sorry, I forgot. You'll see the, the, the other one. I'm too passionate, so I forgot to click. <laughs> so you see what I'm just describing. And you have this uh, uh, fifth zone, which is a tiny one, uh, the Italian zone, which is going to be larger in uh, 1943. Three remarks about that. The French territory is totally broken up, okay, dismembered. Second remark, the expression Vichy France, you know, for over, uh, you know, almost four decades is deeply misguiding since you can just watch that the French territory is under German authority and it will be totally under German authority by November 1942 when <coughs> the Wehrmacht invaded the, the so-called free zone. And third, which is important for our topic, is uh, the chance of, for the Jews to survive are different. Jews who are now in the south of France, in Toulouse, Montpellier, have better chance of survive than Jews who are in Lille, North, Pas-de-Calais, uh, uh, Lens, because this part of the country is under uh, the German uh, authority. And you see here the distinction 
that's a part of the argument of my book between survival and rescue. Survival means geopolitical status of the French territories. And rescue means intentional uh, action from the Jews themselves to try to survive, or the non-Jewish people trying to help Jews. Now, let's not forget our initial question. Where, <coughs> where there, where in, uh, in 1943, 1944? <coughs> I published two uh, uh, maps compiling uh, Vichy uh, archives uh, in 1941 and 1943. This is the slide. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, you will see there that uh, the, the Jews are everywhere in the south zone. Uh, it's, it's, uh, this is in uh, this is the spring 1943. There are more or less 143,000 at the time. So the Chambon is there, okay? The Chambon is in the, the, the free zone, became, became uh, the, uh, the south uh, zone. So this is the main tendency. But let's not forget that, meanwhile, there are more or less 40,000 Jews still in Paris, 40,000 or 50,000, we don't know exactly. Mm. Uh, so they stay in Paris for different reasons. And this is unique in Europe. Can you imagine? In Warsaw, they are almost all disabled. In Amsterdam, this is more or less the same. In Brussels, a little better. So this unique situation of Paris in 1944 has not been not been yet really studied. Um, where are they going to go? Most of them go to the countryside. They go to the countryside because they wanted to be the furthest possible from the German. Uh, and uh, uh, talking about uh, railways, you know, SNCF had at that time uh, an extensive network going to a small, uh, you know, village. Um, and the Chambon is an example. But perhaps it was a private <coughs> line. Uh, this is a general tendency. And plus, plus uh, bus connection with, uh, you know, local, local places so, to, to remote areas. And this, is, this photograph is uh, the photograph of the Landon family, you know, perhaps on of you, of you know the, our famous French actor Vincent Landon. Yeah. Okay, so of course he was not yet born at that time, but the young girl is uh, its uh, future aunt, auntie, and the man is Raymond Landon, former mayor of uh, Etretat, north of France, and former attorney because he was fired by Vichy, and they stayed there in Massif Central until uh, the end of the occupation is they were saved. Um, now, uh, this, this is the, the, the first approach, okay, the first. And the second one about this book is um, trying, describing the different repertoire of uh, coping strategies, avoidance strategies, especially to escape arrestation. Is it possible to identify, uh, I would say, survival Jews patterns? I think it's possible. First is mobility. Uh, it is not, I forgot to put it in this slide, but I'm just talking about that. The second is citizenship. And I'm just, uh, you know, I've just mentioned that more, almost 90% of the French Jews survived the, so this is, was very really intriguing. I discovered this figure, okay? So I tried to understand why. And my main answer is as historian. You know, you have to come back to the French Revolution. The French Revolution in, in 1791 uh, emancipated the Jews as citizens. And from all over Europe, 
Jews came to France. And through the 19th century, uh, they, uh, you know, they were integrated, and some of them moved up as the, you know, the elites of the nation. And at the same time, you have anti-Semitism in reaction, okay, in the 19th century. <clears throat> and when uh, the Vichy government published, issued the Vichy status, the status of three, October 3, 1940, they perceived this law as a political betrayal of their commitment to the nation. However, these Jews, these French Jews, were quite well integrated to the French society. So sociology says they are social resources. So they can, they can react, for example, they can uh, go to the, the free zone or they can uh, send their, their children to, to the free zone. I have many examples of that. Okay? And among their neighbors, among their friends, you have, you have some solidarity. On the contrary, the foreign Jews who arrived very recently in France, in the, let's say in the 1930s, uh, who, they don't speak very well French or not at all. We don't know really the, the country uh, where obviously the target, will be targeted easily by the Nazis and Vichy. So, so third, parameter is solidarity. Solidarity with these foreign Jews, especially, coming from Jewish organization, coming from time, some time to time from Christian organization, especially to protect children. But I think Joanna is going to speak about that. And you have also financial resources. It's obvious, you know, if you have a lot of still some money, it's easier to uh, have a room uh, to pay a people smuggler to Across the demarcation line uh, or the Switzerland border. And <clears throat> also, I'm mentioning the question of age. The young adults are certainly better chance of surviving because they are young, they are healthy, they can walk the night, tonight, you know. Uh, on the contrary, children and elderly people are much more vulnerable and they were targeted as well. And finally, the size of the family, it's important. So the, the larger the family is, the more difficult for, for all its members to move together. So that's why uh, they were much more vulnerable. The decision was to move separately, but some did, and other didn't. For example, like the Ellen Bear family, as perhaps you remember. Now, most of this uh, you know, Jewish organization involved in rescue through so their leaders say afterwards that our work would not have been very efficient if the non-Jewish population were hostile to us, to the Jews. And that really it happened, but not so not so strongly, meaning that Poland is not France in that regard. But there are certainly the question of anti-Semitism, and I don't want to avoid it. So what happened? It happened that uh, there is uh, some evolution in the society between 1940 and 1942. Antisemitism is a reality in France at least since the 19th century. But it's hard to distinguish between antisemitism and xenophobia, as Julian Jackson it, pointed out. Uh, after all, France had the, certainly what, the highest rate of immigration between 1920 and 1930 when the US closed their doors. Um, and there was a debate, it was a debate between historians about this, this uh, intensity and the extension of anti-Semitism in France. For example, Marius Paxton is, thinks that the, the anti-Semitism in France was very strong in 1941, for example. But other historians like Pierre Lavoury, certainly the best uh, 
historian in terms of public, public opinion on Vichy, uh, was strongly against this view, this analysis. But listen, I don't want to be involved in this debate. Complicated, because what is really anti-Semitism, the extension, blah, 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 blah. It's complicated. My main, my main concern is chronology. And as far as um, uh, the, the mass deportation started in July 1942, people were moved, even shot, that the French police arrest women and children. So there was a kind of compassion with, with them. And then came the Valdiv Roundup. This is a good slide? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> in, this, in this, so you have sign of compassion already before the Valdiv Roundup. You know, when Jews uh, wear the Eurostar in Paris, for example, you have, the Eurostar was never introduced in, in the free zone, okay? But then you can notice this and you can find it in different di diaries. But for the Verdi Roundup, it's quite really interesting because I'm, I'm sure you know all, all, all of you, you know this Verdi Roundup. And obviously, this is a, a dark event in the French history of the, of the occupation. However, look at the figures. Vichy and Nazi wanted to, uh, to take more than 27 Jews, and they took, well, that's a lot, but they took half of them, meaning almost 13,000. So how can we explain that? My colleague, Laurent Joly, wrote a vertical, very interesting study about that in, a most recent, in his most recent book. And you see there are four reasons. One, leaks from the prefecture in Paris, French policemen warning foreign Jews of the, the, the arrestation. Two, a communist notice from Jewish, uh, from a Jewish organization that go to hiding. Third, spontaneous help, assistance in the streets or you know, in the neighborhood, it's really documented. And fourth, which is very original, uh, the police officers in charge of uh, arrestation in each arrondissement, some were full of zeal, others uh, dragged their feet. So it's interesting because you see that more than half of the Jews who were targeted and, you know, are going to be deported escaped arrestation because of spontaneous help from some Parisian people. And this is a turning point in, um, in France, uh, expressed by Catholic protest. Some bishops protest at the end of the August 1942. Um, the, the most well-known is Jules Saliège, Archbishop of Toulouse, and the men are the Jews are men, the Jews are women. <coughs> all these aliens are uh, men and women. All is not permissible against them. And you have on the slide the other bishop. But let me just add a word about Saliège. <coughs> Saliège is 70 years old, okay? But he is handicapped. He has aphasia. So it means he cannot speak really. And as it is fascinating that this man who cannot speak properly nevertheless gave a public discourse to defend Jews, to protest against their mass arrestation at the worst moment in our country, that is the summer 1942. And you can see also this evolution within the French society would say more or less a civil society. So ordinary people, the farmer, 
the policeman, the teacher, the priest, the pastor. They uh, have what I call small gesture of help. What does it mean, small gesture? It could be, you know, by uh, the passerby, you know, uh, or don't, above all, don't go home, or just turn right, because the police is at the corner. These small gestures uh, can be uh, certainly more frequent between 1942 and 1944 because of this mass arrestation. Well, they were less frequent before, okay? And you have certainly perhaps three cultural rules in the French society. First, Christian rules, certainly from the Protestants, but also from the, from the Catholics, they are the majority in this country. And I uh, just received, before the symposium, an email from Daniel Goldhagen. Uh, you know him because he's a famous Holocaust uh, scholar, uh, explaining the story of his mother, who was in the girls' camp, and then arrived in Mossack, so in uh, Israel uh, Scout Center uh, in the southwest of France. And I've asked Philippe, please, to read uh, some sentences of his email. So this is a message uh, from Daniel Goldhagen, as you know, is the author of Hitler's Willing Executioners, a book on the Holocaust. And here are his words. My mother was a survivor of the Holocaust who was deported to Gurus from Mannheim in 1940. Through the placement of Jewish children during that time by the various relief agencies, my mother ended up spending a significant amount of time during the war in Wasak at a Jewish children's home that housed some 500 children and was run by Shata and Bouli Simon. As I know there are a number of stories to be told about what transpired in France during the German occupation, I hope that mention of this school will be noted during the discussion, given that the school was untouched, given the heroic efforts of the town of Moissac and those that provided support for the school to function. Unlike Chambon sur Lyon, predominantly Protestant, I believe that Moissac was a predominantly Catholic city, given that the Abbey is an important focus of the city. I hope you, if not one of the other speakers, will make note of this important part of this piece of history of the Jewish survival in this period. That's it. <laughs> you have also Republican rules, as Philip mentioned, especially the teachers, and especially particularly the Jewish children in the public school. There is a fact that I did not know at all, and this is an Israeli historian who took me, you know, pay, you know, mentioned this to me. Um, there are two, can, two countries in which Jewish children were still able to go to public school, that's Denmark and France, except the French Algeria. And the third element is patriotic spirit. People help the Jews not because they love them, but because they want to do something against the German. Um, this kind of small gestures are not act of resistance. I suggest a notion which is social reactivity. Is it another slide? Okay. Uh, to, to express this, it means that, uh, you know, it can through different parts of the society. This is not only France, you know, I don't want to uh, defend the French exceptionalism. Um, uh, it is still is, exists in, in Belgium, in Poland, even, even in Poland, even in the Netherlands, and so on. I just think that between 1942 and 1944, France has uh, experienced a uh, large number of uh, movement of social reactivity, meaning that people who don't know each other and without any instruction are going to help, you know, other people, they don't know either, but they perceive the situation of great vulnerability. Um, there are four characters always in the stories of the Jews' memories. One is 
who say angel, the guardian angel, the author, the forger, and the people smuggler. It's very strange because they appeared in the life of the persecuted Jews and they vanished. This is a certain kind of ephemeral hell. And listen, I dream that someday they will have a play staging these four characters involved in a rescue for you know, the life of uh, persecuted Jews and as a central plot of this play. <coughs> Listen also, I don't want to be uh, too optimistic, okay? Uh, the situation is terrible. And I'm not one to promote a, a rose color glasses history. Some help can be, uh, you know, uh, paid. Of course, you have this question of um, money. And many French people could stay indifferent of the story of the Jews, of the fate of the Jews, and some of them could denounce them. So you have <clears throat> noticed that all of me this uh, personal uh, note, I don't see anymore. And it doesn't mean I see black, I see gray. It means I think in gray, and any uh, connection with the Primo Levi notion of uh, gray zone is purely coincidental. What does it mean for the French situation? It means that on, let's say, on the right, on the extreme right, you have this prefect, which are really bastards, deporting the Jews until the end. You have uh, informers, there are not so many, actually, in France, denouncing Jews. You have militias helping Nazis to arrest Jews in the street or in the house. And the opposite, you have rescuers from Jewish organization, Christian organization, and so on. You have helpers with this small help uh, of uh, small gestures. And in the middle, you have a lot of French people who are going to shut their mouths, even if the Jews are in the neighborhood. I heard several times they knew we were Jewish and they didn't say anything. So here is for me this great political landscape of France in 1943-1944, in which this country is in, really in a uh, civil war at the time under the Nazi domination. To finish soon, let's not forget uh, the children, the Hilden children. And uh, just to mention this movie, very moving movie, uh, The Old Man and the Child, uh, made by a famous uh, filmmaker, Claude Berry. Uh, his real name was Claude Langeman from uh, Ukrainian and Polish origins. And he wanted to uh, make this, make this movie to pay his gratitude to this old couple who took care of him uh, in 1943-1944 in the Grenoble region. And finally, this is a fourth contribution uh, let's not forget as well the international context. So I take here my, uh, some elements of my former book, An Arm Against Hitler, and then I've been contested about that. There are really two different figures, structural figures of the Holocaust uh, losses, meaning uh, in the country where the the Nazi destroyed the state or took control of the high administration. The first case is for Poland, Poland and Ukraine, and the second is the Netherlands or, or, Bel or Belgium. The rate of uh, extermination of Jews is high, even sometimes very high. Um, on, in the countries where uh, there is still a national government like Italy, where they were allied, or Romania, or 
Bulgaria, it depends on the date. Uh, and also we have collaborative government like Denmark and France. The rate of extermination is lower because the Nazis uh, ask, uh, ask the local administration to do the dirty job. So it was the case of Vichy. And Vichy was really cooperative the first two years of the occupation. But because of the uh, protest of the Catholic bishops, we are less cooperative. And it means they have much of maneuver. And they could have this much of maneuver before the protest of the Catholic Church. So this is a way for me to uh, politically uh, condemn, condemn you know, Vichy policy in this, the two first years, because they, Vichy was really a, 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 an anti-Semitic and uh, a national, uh, xenophobe government. And the proof of this um, uh, evolution of Vichy was found by uh, Serge Lasfeld. Uh, you see this, 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 this is a German document in which uh, Laval says that we are not going to, we are going to collaborate, okay, but we are going to collaborate less because we have protest decision from the Catholic Church. So, and you see, I think, the, the, the different uh, figures of uh, the deportation in France. It decreased in 1943, and unfortunately, it increased again in 1944, because the Nazi, the Vichy regime, became uh, a militant state. So, the conclusion of this work is to understand uh, the survival of Jews in France uh, involves a multi-structural approach. It means that survey, survival involves you know, geopolitical factors linked to the status of the territories, international factors, the evolution of war, I did not speak about that, and also intentional factors uh, explaining through uh, survival from the Jews or for other organizations. So I would never say that 75% of Jews survived in France, uh, were, were saved in France, were rescued in France, but they survived. This is different. And the main argument, perhaps, is that the French society, or segment of the French society, operate as a safe guard in order to prevent Vichy going farther, too farther on the deportation of Jews. But fortunately, the Allied landing in 1944 was successful. Otherwise, the rates of the Holocaust in France would have been worse. Thanks so much.